to everyone today. I don't think I see any first-time guests offhand. If I do, I apologize for not realizing it, but it's good to see everyone today. And those of you that are joining us online, we welcome you as a part of this service today as well. Amen. Praise God. I want to read one verse to you at the beginning. I'm going to read a bunch of verses today during the message. It's kind of interesting to me. It's kind of a sad thing to me. I hear people make references. Some people say how wonderful it is when a preacher uses a lot of Scripture. Because... It seems like a lot of messages today quote different people. They're maybe nice, positive, encouraging thoughts. But, but this, this is the basis of everything we do. So, one verse now, but many later. First Peter chapter 3. Verse number 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer. And all of this verse to really kind of get to this one point. It says, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason. And, and this next part is where I want to draw your attention to that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, giving that answer, giving that response. But the hope that is in you, the hope that is in you. God, I thank you for the privilege of being together today to worship and exalt your name. You are always and will always be worthy of our worship and our praise. We'll never praise you enough. We'll never praise you and worship you too much. Everything we could ever give, you're worthy of that and even more. So thank you for the privilege of joining together with fellow believers to worship and exalt you today. I thank you for your presence here. I thank you for your spirit that is working here today. God, I pray this morning that you would speak to us, that you would minister to us through your word. Pray, God, again today that I would not simply stand up here and preach a sermon, but that you would let me be a messenger to deliver a word that would come directly from you. I pray, Father, that faith would be released in this place today to mix with your word that we might be profited. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Before I really get into this message this morning, I want to just preface by telling you, reminding you, declaring to you today, we, we cannot do this by ourselves. We cannot do this on our own. Yes, first and foremost, we need Jesus. But whether you like it or not, we need each other. We are a part of a body. This is the body of of Christ. We are members of the body of Christ. It is, I don't have time to get into some deep theological explanation of this, but it's not individuals that are going to heaven. It's not individuals. It's the church. It's the body. And so you and I must be a part of the body of Christ. I do not believe that this congregation is the body of Christ. But I am here because I believe we are a part of the body of Christ. And if I didn't believe that, I'd be someplace else. 
The body of Christ is made up of people all over the world. And it's not about a name brand of a religion. It is about following the biblical plan of salvation. But it's not about a name brand of religion. So I I want you to know because the the, the direction of this message is kind of different than, than that point. But I just want to remind you at the outset that that you need the body of Christ. I've heard of people who have said, I don't know that I can say I've ever heard anyone tell me directly, but I've heard many times, many stories of people who have claimed to be Christians, claimed to believe in God, but just, I don't need church, I don't need the church. That is absolutely contradictory to what the Bible tells us. You've got to have the body of Christ. You've got to be connected to the body of Christ. The moment one of your physical members of your body gets cut off from the body, it can't live anymore. So it is with the body of Christ. If you're not connected to the body of Christ, you can't live by yourself. Life comes from being connected to the body and the the blood and the things that flow through the body. So we need each other. We've got to have God designed it that way. But I've also come to preach to you today, you need something within you. That there's got to be something within you. And Peter says that you need to be ready to give an answer. And that could be a whole other message for another day. But he says the thing you've got to be ready to give an answer of is the hope. That is in you. And really the context of what he's saying in this verse is people recognizing the hope that is in you. How come you're smiling in the midst of a chaotic world? How come you're smiling in the midst of sickness? And how come you're smiling in the midst of financial difficulties in your life? How how come you're not afraid? How come you've got peace? How, How come you've got assurance? He says, you need to be ready to give an answer for that. But I want to tell you, it ought to be recognizable that there's something inside of you that others don't have. The hope that is in you. I got a question. What kind of hope do you have in you today? I believe that every time we come together for church services or oikos gatherings or whatever other gatherings it may be, that there ought to be people who came not necessarily feeling well, and I don't really mean that necessarily physically, but that's fine as well, but maybe struggling, weary, discouraged, whatever, but at some point during that time, together the spirit of the Lord ministers and by the time they leave they leave differently it was a principle with the, the, the temple that, that you weren't supposed to go out the same door. Y'all don't know it, but since COVID, we, especially, well, not as much anymore, but before we had to close off the doors, we were, as, we were being more biblical than we had been. As you came in one door and you went out another door. That's the way it was in the temple. If you came in the east gate, go out the west gate. If you come out the north gate, go out the south gate. The principle is, don't leave the house of God the same way you came. Can I tell you this morning, I'm I'm just a little side road here for a moment, but the more you get comfortable with coming, I know this is not... I, what, I don't know why every single time I make a point like this, I feel like i got to defend it all, so I'm just not going to defend it. I'm just going to say it. Every time you come to this sanctuary, it, the more comfortable you get with coming and leaving the same, the easier it comes to get, the easier it becomes to come and leave the same, and the harder it becomes to come and make up your mind, I will not leave the same. 
And I don't want this to sound defensively this morning, but you leaving differently than you came is not on the worship team and it's not even on me as the pastor. You leaving differently than you came is all on you because you've got to make up your mind. I'm not going to go out the same way I can. If I came in with anxiety, I'm going to leave with peace. If I came in hopeless, I'm going to leave with hope. If I came in discouraged I'm going to leave encouraged because if nobody else knows what I need he knows what I need and if nobody else comes to me I'm going to go to him Hallelujah. So, there, you, you've got to know. I, I appreciate, I preached it and I'll preach it again many times. The psalmist said in Psalm 73, I, my steps had almost slipped until I got to the sanctuary. When I get around others, there's some strength that I, but there's also got to be something in you. Because at best, you're only here about six hours a week. Max, at the most, on the average week, we're not in this sanctuary together more than six hours. The majority of your time, you're out there all by yourself. And you better have, if there's ever been a day and time in which you better have something within you, today is the day that you need something within you. I, I, I am troubled. I have been troubled. And I, I don't see, a, like I said, if, I, if you're a first-time guest, I, for some reason I'm, I missed the memo. Everybody I see or rec- notice here this morning, you're, this is not your first time. So I'm going to preach a little differently than I would have if there was brand new people here. But one of the things that has disturbed me the most in the last almost two years now is the lack of difference between the world and the church. I'm not talking about our lifestyle and our dress and our appearance. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about our mindset. I'm talking about fear and discouragement and depression and anxiety that there are church folk that have just as much as that of that as the people that don't know anything about Jesus. You and I are supposed to have something within us that is not dependent upon what is without us. So yeah, there's a part of this that we could preach this morning. There ought to be something about you that people that recognize and you need to be, but that's not the the message this morning is you better have something in you. You should, and the good news there is, the good news is that there is something available to have within you. Hebrews says, chapter 6, verse 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things, two unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. God cannot lie. God cannot fail. Because if God lies or God fails, He can no longer be God. This afternoon, there's going to be two teams that lose. There's four teams left in the NFL playoffs. And yes, one of them is not the Cowboys anymore, even though it should have been. And so, there's going to, but there's going to be two teams that go home today, and their season is over. I don't know which one they're going to be, so I'll go back to last week. The Green Bay Packers are still the Green Bay Packers. They lost, but they're still the Green Bay Packers. The Tennessee Titans lost, but they're still the Tennessee Titans. 
You understand if God loses, He doesn't just go home and continue to be God. If God fails you, He doesn't just, oh, my bad, sorry about that. Well, we've sung, we've prayed, we've worshipped. Now I guess I'll just see if I can preach through it. Somebody needs to get some hope today that God can't fail you because if God fails you, then there's no God. But if there's a God, He cannot fail because if He fails, He's not God. So He made an oath, a promise. And then verse 19 says, This hope, This hope that he's talking about here is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that with entereth into that within the veil. This hope is the anchor. I like the terminology here. It didn't say this hope is the foundation. We know some things about the Word of God that there are some typology of the foundation. But in this verse, it talks about the hope is an anchor, not a foundation. And I like that terminology because if we all, most, I think everybody in here knows what an anchor is, and everybody has probably seen at some point a picture or a video of a boat or a ship that was anchored. You see, if this building moves, we got problems. Because storms blow through, winds come, but we expect the foundation to not move. But it's different when you got an anchor and you're out in the water. You move. If it's wavy, the boat moves. If it's windy, the boat moves around, but it only moves so far because there's an anchor that while everything you see is shifting and turmoil and chaos that anchor keeps you held in the basic same position and so the scripture says we've got a hope that is our anchor why am I still here because there's been a lot of winds that have pushed me around but I got an anchor there's been a lot of turmoil in the world but I've got an anchor And the anchor is hope. The anchor is hope. 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 The problem is most of us, myself included, our idea of hope is wishful thinking. Hope. I don't know why. I don't really have a reason. For I know a bunch of you don't have anything to do with sports, don't like sports, but to us that do, you can at least relate. So I, I don't know why, but I, I was hoping the Buffalo Bills would beat the Chiefs last week. I don't really, I, it's just my hope. I don't know. It was wishful thinking. It was just a hope. Anybody hope you get a raise this year? Anybody hope? I got a question. Y'all keep those hands up. Keep your hands up if you hope you get a raise. How many of you that got your hand up hope you get a raise? You don't really expect to get a raise this year. Put your hand down. Okay, we got a few of you. That put your hand down. A few of you others are just trying to look real spiritual. Because you don't really think you're getting one, but you want everybody to think. No, I'm just kidding. I hope, I hope, I hope this happens, I hope that happens, but when, when most of the time when we hope for something, there really is just as much expectation of it not happening. So therefore, when we hope for something and it doesn't happen, yeah, there may be some disappointment. But for the most part, when we hope for something and it doesn't happen, we get over it because we were just hoping. That's not what this biblical word hope is. This word hope is, well, I hope God helps me, or I hope God answers, or I I hope God's there, but if He's not, then oh well. No, this word hope, one of the definitions of this word hope is a confident expectation. 
Not a wishful thinking, a confident expectation. It's a hope that says, I don't have it yet. The Bible says, if you have what you hope for, why are you hoping? The reason you're hoping for something is you don't have it. But in the context of the Word of God, faith is the substance. It is the substance of what is hoped for, the evidence of what is not seen. It's not just a wishful. It is a confident expectation it is a confident expectation that whether it's things that affect us collectively or if it's things that are impacting me individually my family my home it is a confident expectation that God is in control that God is going to work everything out for the good I'm not just hoping I know Peter says you need to be ready to give an explanation for that. Because there's a whole lot of people that don't have that. And the church is the only ones that have the answer for that. If you're here today and you still have any hope left in our government to fix our world, you need to go get checked. Because it doesn't matter what party's in office. It doesn't matter if we got a Republican president or a Democratic president. None of those things matter. Because none of those things can fix it. But my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness on Christ. The solid rock I stand. All other ground is seeking sand. So I don't 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 get don't get a, don't get mad at me. I, I, any it seems like there's some things. The moment you reference them, it's automatically political, and I don't mean it that way. And if that's the way you take it, and you and Jesus can work that out. We're, we're, we're almost two years into this pandemic. The government can't stop it, can't fix it. And if you got your, oh boy, if you got your faith and confidence in a vaccine alone, I know the numbers are people vaccinated are having less sickness, but they're not keeping people from, because there's only one thing. There's only one thing that can keep me from COVID, cancer, heart disease, an accident, a tragedy. There's only one. And that's where my hope is today. It is a confident expectation. Oh, hallelujah. So, so look, 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 look at this. I, I think really this is an example. I, you're not going to see the word hope and whatever in this passage, but I think this is a perfect example of the sort of the gist of this message this morning. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse number 1. The Bible says it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. And if their wives and their sons and daughters are gone, what is the reasonable expectation? Not just they've been captured, but they're probably dead. So, I mean, this was a very bad situation. 
Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. Because the soul of the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David got a call from his deacon. But David got a call from his pastor. But David got his name put on realm for a prayer request. Nothing wrong with all that. But that didn't happen. David encouraged himself. There was something within. It's great to have people on the outside to speak in. But there's going to be some times that you need something within. That if there's nobody else around, if nobody's calling, if nobody's texting, if nobody's stopping by for a visit, I got something that I can draw from down on the inside and nobody else might encourage me, but I'll just go ahead and encourage myself. Myself. He encouraged himself. And I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to try to be kind of mindful about the way I make this next point because we got slang that we use and, and all of your minds are just going to go in the gutter. So, But, but, but it's, it's important... What comes after, and I'm going to add the word conjunction to make this sound a little more sophisticated. It's important what comes after the conjunction but. I was going to just say it's important what comes after the but. All of y'all sophisticated folk. It's important. The order is important. Because this is what some of us do. This is how some of us do it. You get, I got, I got a disease, or excuse me, God is a healer, but the doctor said, God is a provider, but I know all the bills I got. God is a way maker, but I never had something this big before. You got to change the order. The doctor just told me I got a terminal disease. But God is a healer. I just looked at my bank account and I don't really have enough for my needs. But God will provide all of my needs according to his riches and glory. I got a situation that I don't have an answer for. I don't know which direction to go. But God is my way maker. I'm in the valley of the shadow of death, but God is my shepherd. You see, if that verse was flip-flopped, it'd have been a whole different story. David encouraged himself in the Lord, but they spoke of stoning him. Because whatever comes after that B-U-T is the last thing on your mind. So if what comes after the conjunction is the negative, you're going down in a spiral. But if what comes after the conjunction is the positive, the last thing I'm thinking about is the goodness of God, the power of God, the grace of God. David encouraged himself. That word encourage has got an interesting definition to me. That word encourage means to fasten upon. 
So David's got all these people that are mad at him. They're talking about killing him. He could have fastened himself on all of that. But rather than all of that, he fastened himself on the Lord. If you don't know it, Google it. Texted Esther this morning. Got a ninja coffee maker and we bought one because she had one and recommended it and I don't know the last couple days the coffee is just not as warm not as warm I was trying to figure out is there a temperature control and she responded and said she didn't really know she said you google it I google it and I didn't get an answer which is amazing because we know Google has all We know Google's got more answers than this. We do know that because that's oftentimes the first place we go. Oh man, I got a pain in my head I've never had before. Instead of going here, that God is a healer, we go there. Let me tell you something. If you're still going to Google when you have symptoms, you are, I'm sorry, this is a biblical term, don't get mad, you are a fool. Because I can pretty much guarantee you in just a matter of a few moments on Google, you have a terminal disease with days left to live. I'm not speaking hypothetically, I've done it. Years ago, probably 15 years ago or so. That's before I even knew how powerful Google. We were just starting to learn how great Google was. How great is our Google? Sing with me, how great is our Google? Anybody ever see that? This is completely carnal off the subject, but I'll give you a break for a moment. Anybody see that video of that guy? He bought his, I think they were Italian, he bought his Italian parents a Google, one of them Google, what do you call Lexus, not, what's Google, just Google, Google Home. And so his, his Italian grandmother with an extremely thick accent is trying to get Google to, it basically was just, hey Google, hey Google. I, 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 years ago, kids were pretty young at the time. I, I, I had some symptoms going on in my body. And I got on the computer. Oh, my Lord. I need to make sure my life insurance is paid off. I mean, and, I, and I remember one day, I don't remember what was going on, but I, I, I kind of was short with my wife. And so finally I decided to break the news. Now listen, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I know you, I'm kind of, but what you don't know is I got some symptoms that I found out. I'm, I'm dead. I might as well. Here I am 20 years later. What are you fastening on today? What are you fastening on today? I've said it several times recently. You can't, um, to my knowledge, it is not possible to think about two things at one time. You can only think about one thing at a time. So you can fasten on all the bad news and the bad reports, and that can be what you fasten on, or you can fasten on the promises of the Word of God and the hope that is in you. but it's got to be in you. Tomorrow, it's not going to be what I'm preaching that inspires you. Wednesday night, when you're laying in your bed and can't go to sleep because of what's going on, it's not going to be the worship team that helps you get through. There's got to be something that you can draw on that is within you. Jesus, Jesus, God manifested in the flesh. 
when in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. Combated the temptation with three times. He started off by saying, It is written. I mean, Jesus could have just said what he wanted to say because he was God. But Jesus in the flesh said, the, the man Christ Jesus says, it is written because what is written is unchanging. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But the Word remains the same. You need to come to church. You need to be taught. You need people to preach to you. You need people to teach you. You ought to watch good messages and good teaching and all that stuff online that you can. You need all of you. All of that's great and helpful and positive. But you got to know, not what I say is written. Well, Antioch, no, it's not what Antioch says. You got to know what this book says. Because when push comes to serve, it's about what the book says. Not what anybody else says that the book says. It's what the book says. So you need to know it is written. So here we go. I, 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 I don't always do this, but I got a lot, so I gave them to the media team. So they'll try to keep up, and if they don't, that's no problem. But here we go. Let me give you some examples. A bunch of these are just going to be some psalms of David. Let me give you some examples of what I think this looks like in the Word of God. Job chapter 23 and verse number 8. Job says, Behold, I go forward. He's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hides himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. You get what Job's saying? I don't know where God is. I pray, I worship, I fast, I do everything I know how to do, everything I'm supposed to do, and I can't find God. But here's what I'm going to fasten myself on. Here's what I'm going to encourage myself with. He knows the way that I take, and when He has tried me, I will come forth as gold. I'm going to encourage myself in those moments where I can't seem to find God, I can't seem to get any answers. I've got a hope within me that says even though I don't feel like I know where He is, He knows where I am. He knows exactly where I am. I like, I know some of you are all about your privacy and I'll, there's a lot of areas I'm with you about my privacy, but it took me a couple of years after the Find My Phone app came out before I ever used it. But I, I love it. I, I love it because there's a sense of security. And I, most of the time, I, I don't, my, my first thing, if I want to know where my wife is, my first thing is not to go on my Find My Phone and see where she is. But, but I, I like to be able to do that. Not because I don't trust her. We're in a crazy world. If she's out of touch or something, I you know, I, I want to know. Every now and then, all you get is this shaded circle. That circle can be a mile or two radius. I like it when it's just that one little dot. Let me tell you something. God's not just going, well, I, I think Jim's in Anne Arundel County, I'm pretty sure. I, I know Tommy's in North America. <laughs> oh, he knows. Declan's on the front row. First seat of the left section looking out from the platform. First seat of the right section looking to the platform. He, he knows. And he also knows, and it's a little bit of work for him, he knows exactly how many hairs you got up here because you got a bunch. 
exactly where. So when you're wondering where He is, and if you've never been through a time where you were wondering where He is, you are some, you're just, you got something I don't have. Because I've been through some times, and I'm probably going to go through a few more times, that, Jaleel, I know God is everywhere. I know He can't leave me, but there's sometimes my circumstances make me feel like God has lost, or excuse me, that I can't find Him. And so I can fasten myself on the circumstances. Or I can fasten, encourage myself that He knows where I am. And if nobody texts me and tells me that, if nobody calls me and reminds me of that, I've got something within. Let me get, I, I don't know the, 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 the chronological order of all of these and, and if David wrote these before or after the verses that I just read to you. But I wonder if some of these things were perhaps the things that David said to encourage himself. Psalm 28 verse number 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom can I add? What shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell when they were talking about stoning me because of what happened. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble, He will hide me in His pavilion in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me he shall set me upon a rock and now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy I will sing I will sing praises unto the Lord Oh, Lord. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. I, I really, I hope I've proven enough of a track work record that I try to be mindful, respective, and I try to keep my opinions as opinions to myself. So I promise you, if I make any reference or say anything from this pulpit, then I am to the best of my ability. I'm not saying I do it perfectly, but to the best of my ability, I'm trying to say whatever I feel like God wants me to say. I, I, I'm not here to make a statement for or against quarantine, whatever, I, whatever. At the end of 2020, COVID went through my house. And we were all in closed quarters. And Timothy, not one, he, he wasn't quarantining away from the rest of us. We were interacting. We were all together. And when I went through the whole house, he never got it. Last week, I'm pretty sure Nathaniel tested positive. I don't, I don't. Processing. Me, God, are trying to make sure. I, I, I'm pretty sure I had COVID again last week. I didn't tell. I, that late, they, they tested me when I went to the ER. That thing wasn't tickling my brain. That thing was tickling my stomach. <laughs> and my companion, my better half, my spouse, the one that is my help me, is sitting in the chair next to my bed, dying laughing at me. It wasn't painful, thankfully. I couldn't open my eyes for what felt like 20 minutes after that lady did that. Watering and ah. So I ain't doing that any more than I have to. 
Last week, several of us, myself included, as far as we know, no symptoms, no, my wife never got it. We, we were in close proximity. But the, the point is, you can do everything in your power. And I'm not saying don't be caught. I'm not saying don't use caution. I'm don't, don't. Ugh. But David said, even if my enemies are right there by me, God knows how to protect me. And if God chooses not to protect me, then it's his choice. He's God. Psalm 27 and or skipping down to verse 13, same chapter. I had fainted. I would have given up. I would have quit unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I wonder if that's what David might have been saying. All of those guys were threatening to kill him. And David's sitting there going, wait on the Lord. Just wait. It doesn't look good, but wait on the Lord. It doesn't look like a good outcome, but just wait on the Lord. Psalm 34 and verse 4, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Psalm 42 and 5, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. I know if you talk to yourself, you're a little bit crazy, but we're all a little bit crazy, and I think we're more crazier than we've ever been after what we've been through the last two years. So just go ahead and put your AirPods in, put your headphones in and just talk to yourself a little bit. David, why are you so discouraged? Why are you so afraid? Why are you so overwhelmed? Hope! Hope in God! Psalm 56 and verse 3, what time I am afraid. <laughs> Did anybody hear that? He didn't say, if I am ever afraid. He didn't say, if I ever get afraid. He says, when? I was texting somebody this morning. I can't remember if I actually said this or if I was just, I thought, I know I thought it, but I may have said it in a more diplomatic way. But you know what? You, you need to cut yourself some slack. He says, the psalmist says, that God remembers our frame. That we are but dust. Wiley, that's what we talked about a couple Sundays ago. God remembers. And when you're afraid, God doesn't look down at you and start quoting all kinds. You're supposed to quote what is written. He doesn't look down at you and start quoting all kinds of verses to you. I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. What's your problem? No, God doesn't do that. He remembers our frame. And David says, when I, what time I am afraid, I'm still going to trust in Him. In God I will praise His Word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Verse 11 In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid of what man can do unto me. Psalm 62 and verse 5 My soul, wait thou only upon God. For my expectation is from Him. He only, He only, He 
only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. That's the hope that's supposed to be within Psalms 118 and verse number 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And I ought to be able to get some easy amens on that one. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes, in the government. Verse number 10. All nations compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compassed me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy. I think I read the same verse verse twice. Somebody needed to hear that again. They compass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and song and is become my salvation. You've heard this one a bunch in the last two years. Psalms 91 and 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say, not pastor will say, not the leadership, not ministry, not somebody else. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He's going to deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He's going to cover me with his feathers and under his wings will I trust. His truth shall be that my shield and my buckler thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that flieth by noonday nor for the pestilence we know what that's all about no for, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Solomon didn't get everything right but I think this is one thing Solomon got from his father. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The the righteous run into it and they are saved. I didn't give this one to the media team. I just thought of this one when I was on the platform right before service. So here we go. Psalm 139. O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind, behind and before and laid your hand upon me. What does that leave? He's in front of you. He's in. He's behind you. He's above you. He's got you covered. Such knowledge. The latest numbers from the government is not what's too much for me. The latest economic predictions is not much is not what's too much knowledge for me. I tell you what's too much knowledge is that he is behind me, he's in front of me, and he's got me covered. It's too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Here we go. Somebody hear this. Where will I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? Again, I've said this before. I don't think David was trying to figure out I want to know, God, where I can go so I can get away from you. David was asking these questions as a reassurance that it doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter where I go. You are going to be there. If I ascend up into heaven, you're there. Of course, we know that. We expect God to be in heaven. But how about the next part? If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the see even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me if I say surely the darkness shall cover me even the night shall be light about me yea the darkness hideth not from thee but the night shineth as the day the darkness and the light are both alike to thee uh-huh. To us, 
It's a different world. We're facing things and dealing with things that are all different. It's a new world, and we're trying to get used to it. And as many have said, we're, we're probably not going back to the old normal. We got a new normal. But God says, it don't matter what year it is. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It doesn't matter if you're in the valley, if you're on the mountaintop. It is all the same to me. I'm almost done. Isaiah 59. This isn't the psalmist, but it's some good stuff to have within you. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and His glory from the rising of the sun when the enemy shall come in like a flood. When the enemy, not if. Don't, don't forget what I just read to you in the Psalms. David didn't, wasn't talking about trouble as a possibility. He wasn't saying if trouble comes. If he, was, he was referring to being in trouble. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. It says also in the book of Isaiah, no weapon formed. No weapon formed against you will prosper. You need to make sure you realize what that verse says. And don't read it in a way that it doesn't say. Because I think too often we think of that verse in this way. No weapon will form against me. And so when we see some weapons that have formed, we go into panic mode. God, you said no weapon would form. No, I didn't say that. Read what the verse says. The verse is actually saying weapons will form. That's what it's saying. They will form. But they will not accomplish, accomplish what they were formed to do. So instead of looking at the weapons the enemy has formed against you and going into panic mode over them, you ought to just get your lawn chair and some good old sweet tea and sit there and say, well, I can't wait to see how this one's going to fail. Here we go, one more. I'll try to make it the last one for this morning. You go into a game, especially like a football game, you go in with an offensive and a defensive strategy. You study tapes and you study your opponent and you try to come up with a game plan that is tailored to beat that team. And a lot of times, as good of a strategy as you may have formed, it doesn't succeed. That verse says that that is our heritage. That's what belongs to us. What belongs to me as a child of God is whatever the weapons are that are formed, they will not prosper. They will not succeed. Romans 8, 31. Last passage. What shall we say to these things? What things? Fill in the blank. I love it. Things. What's things? Whatever you say they are. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who or can I also say what can be against us? He that spared not his own son but delivered him for us, all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I was pulling out the name. Y'all, somebody come play. Give them hope. I'm still reading more, but give them hope. I was driving out the neighborhood, this, our neighborhood this morning, almost closer towards the main, or just past kind of the actual entrance of our community. There was a 
there was a little fox that went that already just crossed the street. And that fox was walking out into the field. There's a field with some goats or sheep. I don't know which one they are. And the thought just, I mean, here's this little fox. And, and instantly I was reminded of just a few minutes before that as I walked out of my bedroom door. We'll come out of our bedroom door and it's our family room and that's where Leo sleeps on the couch. And I walked out of the bedroom early this morning to come up here to pray and study. And I mean, he is just knocked out on the couch. I think he opened an eye just to see who it was other than that. I mean, it was nice and toasty. He's on this nice, lazy boy sectional couch got a little dish with water and a little dish with food. That little fox wasn't sleeping on no lazy boy bed last night. He didn't have any owners. God bless you if you're a, a mom or a dad to your dog or your cat. I am not my dog's dad. whatever term you like to use. He, that, that little fox didn't have any of that. All he had was a heavenly father. That when he created the fox that he didn't die for. He didn't come to this earth and become a fox. He came and became a man. And if he will if, if he'll take care of that fox, if he'll take care of the sparrows, how much more? How much more is he going to take care of his own blood-bought children that he gave his life for to purchase your salvation? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? i got to question you. Is that list of things a who? Those are all what's. The question is, who shall separate us? And the things he lists are what's. They're things. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things... All these adversities, all these trials, all these tests. We are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. And so now Paul says, I am persuaded. I've got a hope within. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from the love Nothing, nothing, nothing. That's my hope. Thank you for anyone that's ever and will ever in the future send me an encouraging text message. Give me an encouraging email. Write me an encouraging card. I'll, I'll take them all. Thank you for every handshake and word of encouragement you might give me for a message I preached or whatever. I thank you for that. But, but I got to know. I got to know how 
to just reach down in what's inside of me and encourage myself. That's what's within. He that drinks of this water will thirst again. But he that drinketh of the waters that I give him will never thirst again. That water is going to be what? In you. Rivers. Rivers. There's hope within you for whatever you're facing today. But the good news is you don't have to ration any hope from today because you might need it tomorrow. He said, my grace is enough and it will always be enough. Whatever you need hope for today, God's got hope for today. And whatever's going to come tomorrow, God's got hope for tomorrow. But somehow we have got, folks, if we don't learn it now, we, we're in big trouble because I don't think it's going to get much easier. We've got to learn how to tap into the hope that is within. We're going to keep having groups, oikos groups. We're going to keep adding groups. We're going to keep adding deacons to minister. We're going to keep adding things to support each other. But at the end of the day, you got to have something within you. Oh, God. Help us today to learn from David's Example. And learn how to encourage ourselves. If somebody calls me, thank God. If somebody texts me, thank God. But if I get no calls, if I get no texts, I've got some stuff down inside of me that I can draw from. And excuse the grammar, but if ain't nobody else going to encourage me, I'm just going to go ahead and encourage myself in the Lord. Uh, here's what we're going to do. Would you stand? I want you to stand. Here, here, here's what I want to do. Some of you in this place, you're going through some stuff. I know I know a few of you. I've, I've had communication with some of you. I know specifically some of the stuff you're going through. And then I'm positive. There's a bunch of people here today. I don't know all the stuff you're going through. We're going to do it differently this morning. And again, I, I don't see any first-time guests, so we're, we're going to be a little more to the point. There's some people in this place. You're, you, you got stuff going on. You're going through valleys. You're in some serious, deep valleys surrounded by stuff. So here's what I'm going to invite you to do. If that's you this morning, I want to invite you to come down to this altar, but different than what we normally do. You're not coming down to pray and ask God to help you today. But you're going to come down here, and whatever the situation is, if it's sickness, if it's finances, if it's family crisis, whatever it is, you're going to come down here, and you... Not somebody coming to read your mail and give you a word. You are going to start to declare some things that you know from the Word of God. And begin to encourage yourself. That trouble may not leave immediately. All those problems may not go away, but I know one thing's going to change. That heaviness that's on you is going to change. That depression that's on you is going to change. That cloud that's hovering over you is going to begin to go. If you can't think of a bunch of different verses, if you don't know a bunch of different scriptures, then I got one simple one for you. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, God, you said you are the I Am. 
You're the I am. So whatever the issue is, whatever the problem is, whatever the difficulty is, you are the I am. In the name of Jesus. Come on, this isn't about emotion. If you have feelings and emotion, if you feel something when you do this, awesome. But I don't think when David first started encouraging himself that he was feeling anything. I don't think he had goosebumps on his goosebumps, as he would say. He had to press through and begin to declare. Faithful promises. My God shall supply all of my needs. My God shall supply all of my needs according to His riches and glory. My God is a healer. My God is a way maker. My God is a deliverer. My God is a healer of marriages and families. And that's what my God is. And so no matter how big the problem is, I got a God who is bigger. Come on, David said it. My enemies may be encamped around me, but I've got the Lord also encamped around me. Adversity may have me on every side. I may be in trouble, but I've got a very present help in trouble. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, come on, I don't wanna I don't want this to sound harsh, but some of you aren't gonna get what you need because you're not willing to just declare. You're waiting on God to do it. You're waiting on somebody else to come pray for you and do it. You need to encourage yourself. Your word remains the same. God, I don't know how you're gonna work it out, but I know you're gonna work it out. I don't know what the answer is, but I know you have the answer. The storms may come and the winds may blow. I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word. It will come to great. Great, great is your faithfulness. You don't know anything else. If you can't think of anything else right now, just declare that. Great is your faithfulness. No matter what I'm going through, great is your faithfulness. No matter how dark this night is that I'm in, great is your faithfulness. No matter how big the mountain is in front of me, great is your faithfulness. If you feel led to come pray for somebody, you're welcome to do that. I know I'm saying and I'm going to keep saying, something's got to come from within. But as I've already said, we are a body. In the name of Jesus. I may be surrounded by trouble on every side, but most importantly, God, I'm surrounded by you. I may be hemmed in with adversity, but you're behind me. You're in front of me. You're above me. You've got me surrounded, God. You've got me surrounded, God. In the name of Jesus. You'll never, you'll never let me down, God. There may be some moments where it feels that way. When it's all said and done, you'll never let me down. There's going to be some tough days. I'm going to have to walk through some valleys. But I'm going to go through the valley. I may have to go through sickness, but I'm going to go through sickness. I may have to go through suffering, but I'm going to go through. I've got an anchor. I've got an anchor. I've got an anchor that's keeping me grounded. I put my trust in Jesus. 
He's got an anchor. I've got an anchor. I've got an anchor that won't fail. I've got an anchor that won't fail. I put my faith. Oh yes. My anchor. My hope and foundation. He'll never let me He'll never let you down. There may be moments it seems like it. There may be moments it feels like it, but He will never let you down. He'll bring you through. He'll make a way. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Great is your Great, great, great is, great is your faithfulness, God. Great is your faithfulness. I know I've questioned it sometimes, but it's great. I know I've even doubted it sometimes, but today I declare great. Great is your faithfulness, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, yes. A firm foundation. I've got an unshakable foundation. I've got an unshakable foundation. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is not done. People are not done praying, but if and when you need to go, you're welcome to do so. In the name of Jesus, He'll never, He'll never let you down. He'll never let you down. Never, never, never. There may be some weapons that form. There may be some adversity that comes your way. But you're more. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. I may get knocked down. I may fall down. But a righteous man falls. But he gets back up. In the name of Jesus. 